What up, world? Wax villain, Seattle, Washington. You already know what it is. Welcome to Two Gents Fireside Chat. We got Coal Mine's own Alana Royale. We're going to talk about her Did You debut release. Super psyched. Stay tuned. Nine in the house, Jacob got so I see you. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe I went too long, then it's so long, so long, so long. Maybe I went too long, then it's so long, so long, so long. Florencia Andrada in the house. Elena Royale in the building. Sent the invite. We'll see what happens. Hey, how are you? Hey, doll. Super psyched to see you. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Glad you were able to connect, too. I'm glad we were able to catch up beforehand, straighten that all out. Um, I'd love to go ahead and kick things off, so I just want to explain the format for the show real quick. Welcome, everybody. This is Two Gents Fireside Chat, exclusive debut release, digi single, a lot of Royale and Coal Mine Records. Uh, for me, folks, this was a really exciting, um, you know, release for me. I remember when I saw it, you know, the, the ad on, on Instagram and I'm scrolling and I stopped right away. As soon as I could hear the music, I knew this was something special. I felt the positive energy. And the moment that I started communicating with Alana, I was so stoked because she has so much positivity, enthusiasm and energy. I just could not wait to kind of bring her on the platform, introduce her to all of you and just kind of support this digi release. Um, you know, throughout my research, what I found super interesting was, in addition to kind of reading, I got to kind of see her. I got to see her on stage, the presence. And, and I think there's something to be said about that because she's an intentional performer. Her music is very meaningful. And I'm so excited to see her land on the soul scene at Coal Mine Records. I think we're in for a real, real, real big treat. Alana, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Two Gents Fireside Chat. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. Absolutely. So what I'd love to start off with is, can you just tell everybody who you are, describe your, your music in one, set, in one word, if you can, and tell us where we can find your music? Because I know there is a, an EP, it looks like an EP that might have been produced by Mr. Kelly Finnegan that is not listed in a lot of places. You got to kind of reach for it. Go ahead and tell us. Okay, well, hello, everyone. My name is Alana Royale. And if I had to use one word to describe my music, I think it would be intentional. Yeah. And I, yes, I do have a release that was produced by Kelly Finnegan that came out before this. That was an independent release. And that was kind of like me and Kelly, like getting to know each other getting you know back and forth we traveled back and forth california to nashville working in between tours and it was a really um amazing get to know you project but it was also really difficult every time i try to make a record i have to i encounter some wild like the pandemic honestly coming during the middle of making a record did not surprise me because last time i was in the studio making a record with kelly um I had flights for my horn players were canceled. My grandmother passed away. I literally like left the studio, flew to DC, buried my grandmother and got on a plane and flew back to the studio. And Kelly just stayed in my house waiting for me to get back. And we just kept working. Like I literally was like crying while I was recording because we didn't have time. We didn't have time to like fuck around and like go back and forth. So um, that was called So Bad You Can Taste It. And that was sort of my like step into like elevating my songwriting, elevating the production. And that was the stepping stone to the record that we just finished. Absolutely. I was going to kind of ask about that. What can you share with us about working with Kelly for that very first time? Is there something about working with him that's just kind of magical, right? Um, so I think that 
my relationship with Kelly is really special because he went from, so I opened for Monophonics years ago. Okay. And um, this is like the story I love to tell because I'm a very authentic person, but every once in a while, I sort of just kind of shrink a little bit. Like it's very rare, but it has happened a couple of times here and there. Uh, and I opened for Monophonics and like a couple weeks later, I found Kelly on Facebook and I friend requested him and I was like, you know, do you ever make records? Like, do you produce records? And he was, and I was so nervous. I sent, I always do an impression of myself. I sent him this Facebook message and I was like, um, hi, like, um, I opened for you in St. Louis. Like I was such a baby about it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just not very like me. And I was such a baby. And he was like, yeah, you want to make a record? It was like, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So um my favorite thing about working with kelly and like a, sto a story i could say about us working together is that he went from being an idol of mine monophonics being one of my favorite bands and like the sound of sinning being one of my favorite records ever um to being one of my best friends in the whole world we have a, like we have an extremely close relationship i go to him for so much and he, and he comes to me for a lot too and there's something really beautiful about seeing your idol become your peer and your friend and someone you really love and trust. And we've seen each other through a lot of shit. And yeah. it's so it's just a lesson. Like if you want something, baby, go get it. Like go get it. Ask the questions. You never know who's out there who's ready to work for you. Like just go do it. Yeah, I love that. Um, so that was, I think, 2018. So fast forward to 2021. How did the connection with Coal Mine come across with this monster song? Um, okay, so I actually just finished my record last month in, out at Transistors at Kelly Studio. Mm -hmm. And we started the record in January 2020. Oh, okay. So, so the gag was like, start the record in 2020. And then I was going to go open for Monophonics in March. Mm -hmm. And okay, time out. TV Andorra, I don't know who you are, but baby... Fall in Love Again is the jam of the summer. Tell the girls, turn it up. You are right. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we started this record and we were like, okay, we'll just keep recording it in between tour schedules and we'll do this tour together and it'll be great promo for me. And then we'll like come out of this tour and we'll finish this record and then it'll come out. And then March had other fucking plans, man. Like March said, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not making a record right now. And there I was like, not fucking surprised that I tried to make a record and some fucking shit went down. So uh, we went months and months into the pandemic and we had Fall in Love Again finished. That was the one song that was finished. Well, almost finished. We had, we had not recorded the strings yet. And okay. so Kelly recorded the strings at Transistor while I just stayed in Nashville and I didn't get to be a part of the session uh, physically. But okay. it was like we worked out the arrangement with Carl Marsh, who is like one of the most insane arrangers. And I'm also going to say Lou King just came on here. And Lou King is also one of the most talented arrangers I've ever worked with. Shout out Lou King. Follow him. And if y'all want to make a record, work with Lou King. Um, so then a couple months into the pandemic, you know, we're all like fucked up. And I sang some tracks on Kelly's Christmas record or yeah. one track. And then Kelly was like, yo, I'm the only person in the studio you want to get out here and finish this record so i i drove um 10, miles round trip across america during the pandemic to fin to make this record what was that like there was nobody on the road <laughs> and then when you do did see someone you were like stay the fuck away from me like don't come near me not today no 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 i mean literally it was like so every day so i packed up me and my guitar player got in the car i mm. brought my dog we put our favorite guitars in, we put my fucking good wigs in, and we just were like, let's cruise. And we would like stop at Whole Foods in the morning, get yeah. all of our food for the day so we didn't have to stop anywhere. And then we would literally like drive for like an eight to 10 hours and then stop at the next Whole Foods, get dinner, go to bed and wake up and do the whole thing again. And we did that, we drove from Charleston, South Carolina, to San Francisco, to Boston, back to Nashville. And it was like double gloves on the gas pump, double mask. Like we saw some shit and the craziest thing, I mean, there were so many crazy things, but the night that Joe Biden won the election. Yeah, yeah. 
we were in the middle of nowhere, Arizona, New Mexico to Arizona, the sun was setting and I could see on my phone that everyone was going up. The cities were flooded with people going crazy, dancing in the streets, partying, having a fucking good ass time. And we were like, we're just alone in the desert. Like it was wild. It was so crazy. It was a really bizarre experience. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you talked about Kelly, you talked about the arranger and your guitar player. Who else was involved in, in making the music on this project? So um, my drummer, Nathan, who I love, and he doesn't do social media. So shout out to Nathan for having the ability to not have social media. Uh, Nathan is an amazing person. He lives in a camper and just has a bed and a drum set and wants to be on the road 24 seven. He's been all around the world. He's just one of the most fascinating people ever. Um, my guitarist, Jared Colby, who is my right hand, it, not only in co-writing, but in performing, he helps me tour manage. He helps me just fucking do everything. He like really gets me there. Um, and then Kelly and I had done a lot of writing with Jared and my bass player, Gabriel Golden, who is my best friend, who while we were making the record was supposed to fly to San Francisco and meet us there to record but he had his second baby on the way and his wife is a public school teacher. And it was like one of the most heartbreaking decisions I've had to make. Like we kind of talked, he had a flight book and I was like, yo homie, like it's not safe for you to fly back and forth to San Francisco and Nashville while this shit is going down and you bring something home to your girl and like your babies. And like, so Gabriel like took one and like didn't come to San Francisco and didn't get to play bass on the rest of the record. And so um, Monophonics actually like members stepped up and like helped me oh. record the rest of the record. Like I'm gonna cry. <laughs> it's emotional just hearing this story because I mean, what a decision to have to make, you know? Left my drummer, left my bass player, left my horn players. And so we came all the way to the Transistor Studio and it was basically like, we got to make this record, man. I can't come out of this pandemic and not have anything to go back on the road with to sell. Like, what the fuck? I'm already broke as hell. I can't stay broke another year trying to make a record. So um, Monophonics, like shout out to Monophonics for fucking coming and stepping up and getting in the studio with me. Um, and uh, Viv and Kamiko, who sing background vocals for Monophonics, Viv and I have known each other. Shout out. She's a fucking Berkeley girl. Um, we have known each other since we were 18. Wow. And we went to college together and now she sings for Monophonics and the Atonements. And so we had never been on a pro recorded project together. So we saw each other and we couldn't hug. <laughs> we couldn't do anything. <laughs> it was like, bitch, there's your microphone. You sit over there, I'll sit over here. And <laughs> it was an amazing experience. It was definitely a good distraction from what was happening outside in the world. Although, you know, that shit was hard to ignore. And then Fall in Love Again was the one song that was finished the whole time. So we sat on it and sat on it. And I was like, yo, I'm not going to release this song when the world is just like flip flop upside down. Yeah. And uh, I'll say I'll be tactful and I'll be polite. And I'll say that Fall in Love Again was not for everybody at first. And I was surprised, but then then there came a realization that like fall in love again was it and it was a fucking dope song and everything it had everything you know we needed to like put it out and then coal mine stepped in and they were like yo let's do it so there is a 45 coming yes. there, there is wax coming i promise i know these coal mine motherfuckers y'all are crazy eating me alive in the comments like should be on vinyl and i'm like <laughs> oh, it's, coal mine. it's gonna come on vinyl okay you know it's gonna come jesus christ these motherfuckers they will eat you alive they'll be like this is the best song i've heard all year where's the fucking wax <laughs> well well let me tell you something it's like yeah we heard it and i'm looking you know at the post i'm looking in the comments below i'm like no physical this is like one of the biggest songs of 2021 what do you mean did you release but i get it i, I get it. Listen, i'm a patient man i try as long as I know it's coming. Now, here's my question. Are, is there a color of, of vinyl that you would prefer that, that this amazing 45 be? Well, let me say this. I'm team get money, bitch. And right now, I'm all about keeping the overhead low to increase revenue 
and okay. paying my mortgage again for the first time. In 10 yeah. months. So I don't want to say that I'm like being cheap. I'm just saying whatever coal mine feels is right for where we're at right now. I'm just yeah. going to go with that because I, even though I know that I love this song so much and I know this song is probably one of the best works I've ever done. There's, this is like a marathon, not a sprint. There's a lot of time to go, a lot of time to grow. So, you know, maybe we, maybe when the rest of the record is coming, yeah. you know, maybe we could do some special shit and we turn it out. Yeah, I think you should just tell Terry to put a white label on it and call it OG, right? Uh, Motherfucker, I'll ship test presses for a dollar right now. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to come back because you talked about Whole Foods, but you need to let everybody know about Papa John's. Papa John's? That racist moron? Didn't you used to always eat Papa John's? Wasn't that like the, the meal of choice? No. I thought Papa John's was like... You guys love pizza. He, he, does, I, he does like big game hunting in, in Africa. He, like, I am yeah. not personally a Papa John's fan. I'm not sure where that came from, but I would love to, I would love to check your sources. I'm, I'm, I'm vegan. I'm a thing. It was late last night, but I was like, Papa John's? I'm like, what? Anyways, okay, we'll we'll skip that because no, I, I also I also randomly geotag locations when I post on Instagram, so I will randomly search phrases or weird shit and post that as my geolocation, and it's literally random things from around the world. So maybe you saw something like that. But <laughs> all right, that's I'm, fair. I'm, I'm I'm vegan, so Papa John's is not for me personally. But um, also Papa John, that motherfucker. He's like a big game hunter. He's Wait, like no, that's the Jimmy John's. No, guy. no, oh yeah, Jimmy John's. But Papa, Papa John is racist. is racist. That motherfucker has said too many words that start with too many ends too many times, and we can't play that game. No, I feel you. I'm gonna send you this source because I'm feeling crazy right now. But let's talk about the next question. All right. Okay. So here's the deal. coal mine release. You're not new to the music scene. Could you give us the cliff notes on your evolution as a musician and kind of what led to this sound? So I want everybody to kind of know about the history. I want them to know that you're kind of borderless when it comes to different musical styles. Uh, yeah. And then you adapt at it. Yeah. So I started, I grew up in the punk and hardcore scene. And I, my mom raised me on all sorts of different types of music and you know, when I was younger, I would listen to Gladys Knight and Bjork and Tori Amos and Puff Daddy all in the same day. And listen, I had like Smashing Pumpkins, like bootleg tapes. Like I kind of like fuck with it all. And uh, when I was younger, I played a lot of like, a lot of like heavier music. And, but I always loved hip hop. I always loved soul music. And this is something that my guitar player, Jared and I have always bonded over is like, if you love hip hop, you love soul music. If you love, because you got to understand the art of the sample and where those samples come from. And so if you, yeah. if you love, a re you know, we were just listening this morning to uh, uh, the Blackout, the Red Meth record. And it's like, if you love these records, then you love, you got to love the songs that like made, like, you know, made these samples. So it just, it was a natural evolution to like soul music. I was raised on soul music. And then especially moving to Nashville and going to Stax and like, getting bigger into like vinyl collection i got to dig deeper and deeper and wow. but i'm a 90s r&b girl you know what i mean like i live i live for 90s r&b like i literally had a stereo on the back of my toilet when i was a kid and it had cd and i would just stack cds all over the windowsill and they'd be fucking scratched and all fucking trash and i would just like sing my heart out so even when i was going to like heavy shows and going to hardcore band shows and like local yes. vfw shows i would still go home and listen to my salam remy remix of like my fucking mariah carey butterfly number one record you know what i mean that's very g of you salam remy i mean come on now listen I've okay i will not creep people on the internet i'm very respectful but i do I do creep on Salam Remy on the internet. And I'm going to say right now, one day I'm going to work with Salam Remy. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. We got to speak it into existence, right? Okay. 
So I'm, I'm kind of like cringing right now. My next question also has to do with my research. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm spot on with this and it's not like another Papa John's thing. Um, <laughs> so listen, I'm, I'm scrolling last night and, and I believe I see you give like a mini concert on, on a public bus. Then I scroll down a little bit more and you're performing it at a TED Talk, Nashville. <laughs> so I'm seeing you on all these different big time stages with, you know, different audiences. Can you tell us what it was like that very first time that you stepped on stage, what it felt like, kind of paint a picture with words for us and tell us where it's gone to today when you get on stage. Man, I think like, I get nervous every time I play, not nervous that I'm going to do a bad job, but just nervous because live music you is so unpredictable and you never know what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. I, I push, push, push myself. I push, push, push myself. I mean, like shout out to my therapist because she's taught me how to like have high standards and also like not beat myself up constantly about shit. So every yeah. time I would get out on stage, I would be like, this has got to be perfect this has got to be this way every time. And so like the nervousness wasn't like, I wasn't allowing myself to even get excited. You know, I, when I played Bonnaroo, you know, when I went out to ACL Fest, when, I, you know, I did the TED thing, which was really super dope. I got to be on this like crazy panel, this huge thing in Nashville and spoke in front of like all these celebrities. I performed a Taylor Swift song for like Taylor Swift's mother and her entire team. And it's like, wow. I don't get to like, I don't get to like feel the, excitement in like a positive way it was like this sort of like it, this like nervousness of like you have to be the best always 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 and I've worked on that for so long so now I'm hoping that it can just kind of be like a excitement and a nervousness and not like just kind of this like high impossible standard that I can't really reach and now that I've had shows taken away from me I feel like I'm all fucked up like I have a, my first show back in a year and a half is on Saturday and I'm like really fucking nervous. <laughs> but I give a shit, I give a shit. No, 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 it's good to care, it's good to care. Here's my question. Are you into stoicism at all? I don't think I, I don't know like, if I am. So listen, I got a quote for you and this is like one of my favorite things, right? Cause I'm, I'm awesome at like giving people advice but when I'm in the driver's seat, I, I just lose all that shit, it's gone. Um, but it was by Seneca the Younger, and he said, the things we fear most harm us more in our mind than in reality. And, mm. and oh, that quote resonated with me, and I just had to kind of like, you know, add it to my mental playlist because myself, too, I could do a good job at something, and someone asked me how I did, I'd be like, it was all right. You know what I mean? It's like, you know you hit that bar, but mentally you just have this barrier there. And so stoicism has been something that's really helpful to me. I love it. So when you started talking about that, I had to drop a gem real quick to share yes. that with you. Um, Send me more, honestly, because I am like definitely uh, a sponge when it comes to all of that. There's always an interesting way of like reprogramming your own thoughts and like getting inside and like figuring out where do these thoughts come from? And like, are they like beneficial to you? Are they damaging to you? Especially as an artist when even if you have a team and a label and fans, you're still out on your own. Everything, yeah. you're the source, you're the wellspring. So it can be really exhausting. So send me anything. I I'll got you. Listen. Or Sam. <laughs> um, so listen, we've kind of hinted around Nashville a little bit. I'd love for you to talk to us about the significance of Nashville in your music career. Let us know what the, the sound is like out there because when I think Nashville, I think country, but I'd love to know how you fit into the scene out there with the soul sound. So I'll just be the first to say, you know, I've lived a couple different places. I've toured everywhere. Nashville is unreal. It's unlike anything that you've ever seen. I mean, you literally, there's so, when you think you know everything about music, you can come to Nashville and be like, I still don't know shit. There's so much to know. There's so much, because here down in the South, you have the intersection history and this you have like music history you have political history you have geographical history you have all of these different things that come together and it's just like blows my mind like I was raised in a musical household I always considered myself a very like knowledgeable person and I came to Nashville and I started working at a music venue and I was like I don't know anyone who's playing here 
And there'd be like sold out show after sold out show. And I'd be like, I've never heard of any of these people. I don't know who they are. And it was like a whole culture and then cultures within the cultures that mm. I didn't know about. And when you talk about like, you know, when I moved to Nashville, they were like, you know, the, the like phrase, it all starts with a song. And it's like, it all starts with a song. It's like everything about music you've ever thought about in your entire life, it all started with like the song, right? And it's like, I've seen writers here, you know, I've seen like, I got to go to like a thing with Vince Gill, like a country legend who I didn't know any Vince Gill songs. And he played for me and the other people there, a song that he had written with Carrie Underwood. And it's like, I don't really know anything about Carrie Underwood either. I know like the one song and that she had when she first came out. And he played this song and it was a song they passed on that neither one of them ended up like cutting for a record. And it was one of the most beautiful songs I had ever heard in my entire life. Because there, you can just throw songs away around here because there's the <laughs> best fucking songwriters that you've ever known in your life, like all started here. And then wow. it's like, I made friends with people who were the children of those songwriters who were raised in Nashville. You know, Kesha's from here. Um, Haley from Paramore is from here. Um, like Lily Hyatt, you think there's like all these people who literally grew up in the industry with their parents being famous touring players, session players, songwriters, artists. And these kids are everywhere and they fucking make music and it's just a, this multi-generational thing. It's really crazy. And it really made me feel like there was so much shit that I didn't fucking know. And I've wow. learned so much about music living here. Like music shit, you know, like there's a artist named John Prine and he's a legendary artist, legendary songwriter. He's a folk hero. And he died of COVID this year. And it was like super right. tragic. And there's, there's paintings of him all over Nashville, billboards of him. He's sort of this like icon. And I had never heard of John Prine before I moved here. And I would tell people, I've never heard of John Prine before. Like this is like until a couple years ago. And they would be like, you've never heard of John Prine? And I'm like, well, first of all, I was raised by a Puerto Rican woman. So when you see a Puerto Rican woman at the John Prine concert, you let me know, because there are no fucking Puerto Rican women at the John Prine concert. And when you see people who look like John Prine going to the fucking salsa club, you let me know, because there's no fucking old whites in the fucking salsa club either. It's right, sort right. of about like cultural uh, familiarity, geographic familiarity, and so, I am a way more knowledgeable musician living in Nashville because I've just been exposed to so much. And it is just like everywhere you turn around in Nashville, everyone that I know in Nashville is doper than most anybody I've ever known anywhere. That's really cool. I've always wanted to visit. Um, you know, I just, I wasn't sure what it was like, but I'm kind of excited. And I think it's a place to visit for sure, especially as a music lover, right? Dude, come, 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 come. One of the, I got to you first <laughs> listen listen there's a spot called monel's in nashville and you pay by the seat it's a restaurant and you pay for your seat and the whole restaurant is giant tables like at your granny's dining room with chairs all around it everywhere and everybody sits together and they just bring out bowls of fried chicken catfish fucking collard greens, mashed potatoes, coleslaw, biscuits, and then fucking banana pudding with vanilla wafers on top. And they just keep sending it out and you eat as much as you want family style. And you ask the people at the table like, yo, pass this, pass this, da 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 da. And then you just leave when you're done eating. That's wild. I need to go there. You do, you do. Um, so you mentioned that you got a live show coming up. Tell us about the dates, how we can kind of tap in if we're, we're close to where it's going down. What can we look forward to next from you so we can, you know, continue to follow you on your journey? So I got a, I got this record that I love so much. It's the best thing I've ever made in my entire life. I'm so fucking excited, but I think that's a 2022 thing if I'm being realistic, which mm -hmm. sucks because I just want it to be out now i've already lived through the fucking pandemic i don't want to wait anymore but this industry is about waiting and knowing when the time is right and so i just trust everyone around me i trust my gut and i know that like i gotta wait for time to be right but i'm gonna play my first show back on saturday and then in august i just get back on the road again from new york to l.a a couple festivals and then I warm up and I get ready to hit the road with Monophonics in September and I'll be opening for Monophonics um, for their entire West Coast tour. Are you guys coming to Seattle? Yes, we are. 
I'm so gonna be there. That's dope. Numos? Is it Numos in yeah. Seattle? Numos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Numos. That's a cool spot. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I gotta ask this. Do you think we'll ever see so bad you can taste it on wax? Or is that kind of a one and done deal? I have to ask. It's so good. I know. Well, I will just say, I don't know if they're watching right now, but if you give me a couple weeks, I have another announcement coming and I'm really excited. And I just feel like all the fucking shit I ate during the pandemic and all the time of just like sitting and crying yeah. and being broke and not knowing what the fuck's going on. I feel like it's all gonna start all the work that I did. You know, I just sat down, I minded my own fucking business. I walked my dog, I didn't do shit. I stayed home, I did what I was supposed to do and it's all gonna pay off. So give me a couple weeks and I'll have uh, an announcement and I'm really excited. I love that. Let's transition into the lightning round. So. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The lightning round, these are our 10 questions designed to to let the fans know about you more as a person than a musician. Okay. Um, you don't want, you don't have to answer, but these are fun. Um, what's a song you've been listening to a lot lately? Uh, uh, tonight You Might by Cynthia. Coming out tonight, coming out tonight. Yeah. Da -da -da -da. Nicole Ray, fucking queen. Yeah, yeah. My queen. This is a tough one, LP or 45? Okay, I'm gonna say LP because I, I got a U-turn record player and it's one of the cable, it doesn't have the switch from like the LP to 45 and you have to manually move it and moving it from 45 to back to like the 33 is so fucking annoying and so I don't listen to all my 45s anymore because it's just so annoying, it takes so much time to move. So mostly just LPs now. Wow, I can't believe you have to do that just to like switch the format. It's really annoying. I thought it was cool when I bought it because like the belt is out external and it looks really pretty, but it's really like literally every time I go to turn my record player on, I'll put something on and it'll always be playing at the wrong speed. And I'm like, oh, back again. This drives me fucking crazy. Okay. All right. What's the last album you bought? The last album I bought was, um, man. It honestly, it might have been Jamie by Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Look, I got Britney Spears on the brain right now because her conservatorship trial is happening right now. And when I get off this interview, I'm going to go check and see what happened because I'm really concerned about Britney Spears all the time. But Jamie by Britney Howard is probably okay. one of the last records I bought because she's a genius and I fucking stan. And everything she does, I just can't wait to stick my teeth into. She's just transcendent. Icon. Love, love that. Okay. All right. What's your favorite record store to go to? Um, I will say uh, there's a record store in Fort Lauderdale called Atomic Radioactive. Radioactive. And Radioactive is dope because the location, you know, right outside Miami, it's got like some fucking heat from like fucking like salsa like fucking like to zydeco to fucking pop to like the disco shit i mean like some fucking like some fucking like cocaine fucking like insanity like pawned my records so i could fucking buy a bag <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> okay. yo i love this i love this all right um what's the first section you're gonna go to in the record store once you walk through the doors um always use i don't usually look at new releases i oh honestly dollar bin dollar oh, bin very cool all dollar right bin, dollar bin is wild i was at an amazing record store in um oklahoma once and all of their fucking 45s were uh, a dollar and i had like stacks and stacks i was just pulling out everything because it was like you know oklahoma it was like um old white people so it was like all the old sunny and share records like linda oh. ronstadt like shit i had never seen in the, in the flesh before and as i kept piling them up the owner was like hey those are a dollar each by the way and i was like yeah cool thank you and then he comes back and the pile's bigger and he goes okay 50 cents a piece like you moving this shit like nobody wants it like just take it and i left like with a fucking stack for like 20 dollars. i love that that's like a collector's dream okay oh, and the store owner was his face was painted like David Bowie while he was talking to me. It was amazing. <laughs> wow. That's an experience. <laughs> okay. Um, 
What's something that you listen to that might surprise us? Oh, um, pre-90s Metallica. Pre-90s Metallica, okay. Yeah, like the good shit. The, the first couple records, the good shit. All right, favorite- oh, oh, wait, 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 I have a better answer. I know it's a lightning round, and this is like not the point of a lightning round, but I like prog rock, like nerdy, <laughs> like nerdy, like Rush and Coheed and Cambria. Like I like really nerdy, like Kansas, like really nerdy, nerdy music. I'm getting so nerdy right now because I love prog rock and I have records from Europe. I'm gonna have to send you links. Please, please. I've never heard it likes prog rock. That's so dope. Okay, all right. Please. Uh, two more questions. Favorite album cover of all time? Mm, oh, wow. Um, uh, it might be, it might be one of my favorites it might be Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy. Um, with all the naked like children everywhere going up to this like stone temple because um, when I was young my mom had it and I n was always like it was just that one record you know when you see like books and CDs and records when you're a kid you have like vivid imagery memories that record was such a vivid image to me and it, it I can like see it where it was in my house when I was growing up like how close it was to the back door and this and the tv and this and that it's just always really stuck with me and it, it might be that okay i love that last question tell us one soul artist that we should be listening to that you love um i will say hmm, i think you know what honestly it's okay it's a little bit of like a mix of like old sounds and new sounds but i yeah. will say um cleo soul Okay. Cleo Soul is um, incredible. She is in that group Salt. Okay. And her, I think it might be her romantic partner, but it might also be her musical partner, is one of Michael Kiwanuka's producers. And sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, and her, uh, her last record is beautiful. Cleo Soul is so stunning. Her voice is incredible. She's Spanish and Jamaican by way of England. So wow. she's very interesting looking. Her facial yep. features are wild. She has this like light skin and like like big nose, but like big curly hair. She's just a beautiful, interesting looking person. And I love her and I hope, I wish she would love me too. I'm sold. I'm definitely checking it out. Alana, that takes us to the end of our fireside chat. I wanna thank you so, so much for, for making time to talk to me so that I can share this with all of my friends. I'm so mm -hmm. excited to come for you. I look forward to supporting you. I can't wait for the physical release. Everybody, please, streaming platforms, go check this out there. There's the title. This is the hot song, Waxville on Top. Thank for you. Queen, thank you so much. Have an awesome night and go watch Britney. Yes, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Waxville in Seattle, Washington. You already know what it is and we're out.